Tell what on the mountain? That was overwhelming. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes, you got it. We go and tell it Jesus Christ is born. Why does that matter? Well, we're going to get into that in just a second. But uh, today we're launching a friendship revolution based on what Jesus has done for us and is doing through us. And it's really, really, really exciting. So we're building on what we celebrated last weekend and we continue to celebrate that Jesus Christ is born. Uh, It's that Christmas celebration. And can you imagine if your birthday had the effect that Jesus' birthday has had on the whole world? So for instance, we realize that eventually our entire dating method pretty much around the entire world changed because of the birth of Jesus. We go from B.C. to what? A.D. A.D. meaning that in the year of our Lord in Latin, right? Not after death, but in the year of our Lord. Um, And so this little cartoon, Joseph is trying to write, you know, thank you notes after Christmas, right? And he's like, rats, you know, I've got to change from B.C. to A.D. Dag gone it right and so we know that frustration that when we go from 2017 to 18 for the first few weeks we're going to write 2017 aren't we just used to it you know it's hard for us to make that kind of a transition well imagine your birthday affecting the entire dating of everything around the whole world to the point that you know like in my case wow when Nathan Custer was born that was year one Can you imagine dating your checks off of my birthday? Like, that's insane, right? So even if you are kind of iffy on, was Jesus really the Son of God or not? Did he do these miracles or not? You know, what, how, how do you put this together? Even if you're kind of skeptical on that, you can't be skeptical on the fact that this made a difference in our world. New York Times is going to use the dating method now based off of, you know, kind of approximately when we thought Jesus was born. That's crazy. But that's the, that's part of an effect that Jesus had on the world. But but let's get a lo- little more specific and how he shook up the religious world spiritually and s- continues to have that uh, kind of influence on us right now. And so if, to kind of take us back a couple thousand years, you remember that he's born into a Jewish context um, in the Jewish part of the world uh, to a religiously observant family. And he rubbed shoulders as an adult with a lot of people that took their faith really seriously. So they understood the Jewish customs and the Jewish Old Testament. It was just simply called the Bible, their their, their holy book, you know, the scriptures. And we call it the Old Testament now because we've got kind of this new one based on the the teachings of Jesus. But if you take a regular Bible and you look and you see two-thirds of it, the very first two-thirds, that was the Hebrew Bible. It was the scriptures. It was what his family knew. It's what he was trained in. He knew Um, these were really, really important things to the people of that day. And in that Old Testament, there are a bunch of rules regulations, there's advice, but especially commandments. Somebody figured up, I think it was 613 different individual rules, and and that was helpful to know how to live in order to follow God. If you're going to follow God, here are all these rules that you should follow. But the Old Testament is complicated. Have you ever tried to read through the the Old Testament, like the whole thing, you know, from, from the beginning all the way? I mean, you start reading, it's like, wow, this is kind of hard to get through for a lot of people. And not only that, it's not only hard to get through, it's hard to understand. And then it's really hard to apply. Like, how do you, how do you follow the, all these rules? And then the Jews had some serious problems trying to figure out how to follow it because there would be things like instructions on how to worship at the temple and what kind of sacrifices to give at the temple. But then if they got captured and moved to another country, you know, a whole other part of the world, how do they obey those commandments to sacrifice at the temple because they can't get back to Jerusalem. So, I mean, that was just the tip of the iceberg of how complicated this was. And so there was this kind of argumentation within Judaism, continues to today, just as in the Christian world, we're trying to figure out how to interpret the whole Bible and the New Testament and stuff. The Jewish tradition has, has had this kind of discussion now. What's important? What's not? And so when Jesus came along, he distilled kind of the whole problem into this laser-sharp focus on a couple of parts of the Bible and said, this is the most important thing for you to do. Here's the story. Mark chapter 12. A lot of scholars today would say Mark is the earliest written gospel. So, you know, closest to the time of Jesus, written, you know, kind of a short book. You know, as you read it, as we get to Mark chapter 12, 
in case you're looking up in your own Bible or on your tablet or something, Mark chapter 12. I'll start with verse 28. And here's, here's this story where Jesus changes kind of the religious landscape and the spiritual kind of understanding. One of the teachers of the law came. This is Mark chapter 12. And that teacher heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with your whole heart and with your understanding and all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Now, in that context, Jesus' first part of his answer would have made total sense to most of the Jews of that day, regardless of what kind of teacher you followed and everything, because they had this part of the Bible that we call the Shema that is um, in the book of Deuteronomy that even in the Scripture itself, in the Hebrew Bible, kind of stands out as a really important part. The book of Deuteronomy is kind of a summary of the first five books of the Bible. They were really revered as coming down from Moses in some way, shape, or form. And um, chapter 5 in Deuteronomy is a retelling of the Ten Commandments. So then chapter 6 is kind of a summary of, of those. Totally makes sense. Chapter 6 in Deuteronomy even begins with that very phrase, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then verse 5, love the Lord your God with all your heart and strength. And, you know, so it's like, okay, that really makes sense. Not very controversial. Important, yeah, that's good. Love God, that makes sense, though. If, if you believe that there's a creator of the whole universe, doesn't it make sense to kind of like honor that creator? Yeah, I mean, that's like the, your boss's boss's boss, right? You know, the, the creator that owns everything, it makes sense to make that person, that God, number one. Makes sense. But Jesus didn't stop there, did he? Which doesn't quite make sense because the teacher of the law that was challenging Jesus only asked for one commandment, right? What's the most important one? Jesus answers. But then Jesus is like, but that's not the whole story. He, he, Jesus is like, look, you can think that you're loving God and still be missing love of God. Because he says, not only do you have to do that, but equal to that and concurrent with that, you've also got to love your neighbor as yourself. Now that's kind of radical because that means that I cannot say, I love God, I love you God, I love you God, and then be a jerk to other people. I can't do that. Like that means that I don't really love God. In Jesus' words, loving my neighbor as myself is the number one way that I can know whether I'm really loving God or not because God created everybody, so I've got to love people. If I'm mistreating people, it means that I'm not really loving God. Now, we Christians need to know that, right? Because a bunch of people that call themselves Christians in Europe started having wars and killing each other over things like um, how should the bread and wine be prepared and given in Holy Communion? Now, can you imagine killing somebody over that kind of conflict? But if you take that and how people were baptized, should you baptize a baby or not? Can you be baptized more than once? Does it have to be totally under the water or not? That got people killed that, that, by people that called themselves Christians. And, oh, who are, who's the most important religious leader? That was another reason why in Europe you would have religious wars and why even today, if you go to Germany or you go to France, you go to different places, a lot of people don't want to be called Christians because they're like, we've had enough of that. And those people that called themselves Christians killed each other over that kind of stuff. Now imagine how stupid that is. Mary Casto sitting over here is one of the nicest ladies in the whole world. Amen? Right? Those of you that know her. Can you imagine... Me saying, okay, here's how we're going to do communion. And then her saying, kill him! That's wrong! And coming up here with a knife, I'm like, ah, I gotta kill him! I mean, can you imagine that? 
Some of you are like, I mean, now that's silly, right? That's ridiculous. Like, that's so radical that you guys are like, I can't even imagine her ever doing that or me doing that to her. You baptized how? Ah! You know, I can't imagine it. But Christians that got this part of the Bible wrong got convinced that this is something we ought to kill each other over. How'd we do in America? Ah, well, we did pretty well for a while, and then we had this thing called the Civil War where people on both sides of the Civil War considered themselves what religion? Christian. We said, oh, we're Christians, so let's kill each other over owning other people as slaves and over how we're going to organize our government. Let's kill each other over that. I mean, so we have this history of getting this wrong when our religious leader, who we say we follow, if it's Christ, said, love God and then love your neighbor as yourself, you've got to do both. If you want to know what's most important, you've got to do both of those things if you're going to follow me. And those of us that, that then don't do that, we have no right to call ourselves Christians. Because that's like being a traitor in another country. What do we do to traitors? If you get a convicted of treason in America, what happens to you? <coughs> We don't see you for a long time, right? You go to jail, or you may even get executed for, for being a traitor, saying that you're an American and then not living in a way that's consistent with that. Well, it's even more important, as we call ourselves Christ followers, Christians, that loving God and then loving our neighbor as ourselves, equal to, just as important, we care about other people, loving other people. And that's not Nathan, you know, being all touchy-feely or whatever. No, this is Jesus when he's cornered saying, what's the most important thing? This is what he hones in on. Now, that's, that's one thing that he does. He, he kind of shifts the focus to that. But the second thing that he does is Jesus, in looking at this, he reinterprets the Old Testament and gives us a way to kind of make sense of this very hard-to-understand book. What do I mean? Well, we talked about in Deuteronomy 6 how that made sense. What's most important, Jesus? Love God, right? That made sense. But if you look at what he quoted of the Old Testament, for love your neighbor as yourself, this is going to shock those of you that aren't very familiar with the Old Testament. This is going to shock you. This is really cool. You're going to be excited you came today. You, 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 know, you came through the blizzard weather to come here. Here's something really neat to learn. Okay, Love your neighbor as yourself. When you look that up, where is it in the Old Testament and what did he quote? You're going to look in the book of Leviticus. Still the Old Testament, still in those first five books of the Bible, it, came down from us from Moses or somehow in some way that way. Chapter 19 in Leviticus is entitled in this Bible, Various Laws, okay? Which gives you a hint. This is going to be complex. They're just various, different, okay? The first part of that chapter are laws that most people around the world would say, yeah, if there's a God, it makes sense that that's somehow the way God wants us to live, right? So first part of chapter 19 um, respect your mother and father. My parents are here today. Woo, right? I'm trying to do that, right? I can't disrespect them. If there's a God that created the world in this way, it would make sense that we would do that, right? Um, be holy because I, the Lord, am holy. That makes sense. Don't turn to idols. Makes sense. Verse 11, do not steal. So now you see it up on the screen. As you go through the first part of this chapter in the Old Testament that Jesus points to as containing the one of the most important things ever. As you go through that, okay, don't steal, uh, don't lie, don't deceive one another. Does that sound weird? No. Then you get to verse 18, the second part of verse 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Makes sense. Here's the very next verse. Right up against that, no break, no difference, no shifting of focus. Here's the very next verse. You ready? Verse 19. Keep my decrees. Do not mate different kinds of animals. Do not plant your field with two kinds of seed and do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. Boom! Word of God. You bunch of sinners. If you got a wrinkle-free shirt on or blouse, something like that, you sinner. That's a couple of different types of, of uh, fabric probably woven together, right? A cotton polyester blend. Sinner! You're breaking the, you're breaking the law. That's just as bad as, as stealing. On a, on, you know, you see where I'm going with this, right? It's all the same chapter. Law, 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 law. Do any of you garden? You've got some tomatoes and some beans in the same field? Sinner! Right? I mean, can you imagine? Like, now, we can laugh. We can make fun of this. But this is so important that in some Jewish communities, even today, there's a special person that you can call, religious leader, you can call to come to your house 
who will look at every piece of your clothing, look at the tags, do tests of the fibers to make sure you're obeying this commandment. You see where we're going with this? Like, and, and that makes sense because it's all right there. It's all that same chapter. Love your neighbor is in that same chapter. But Jesus, he plucks out love your neighbor as yourself and says, that's way more important than the cotton polyester blend or than your garden or anything else like that. So we as Christians, when we say, hey, here's a part that we're going to follow, here's a part that depends on whether you like to iron or not, you know, we don't care. Do what, We're not making that up. We're saying that our religious leader said, love your neighbors yourself is more important. It's as equally important as loving God. Because remember, the, the guy that challenged Jesus was only asking for one commandment, right? Jesus gave him two because it's like part A and part B. You can't separate them. It's not Nathan saying that. That was Jesus saying that, right? So that was controversial back then because people started being a little mad when Jesus' followers wouldn't quite follow the understanding of the Old Testament that had been followed. And then Jesus kept on needling people to say, are you really loving people? You're following these commandments on your, on your offerings and on your sacrifices, but are you caring about people and forgiving them? You know the teachings of Jesus lean that direction, right? Now that's wild, okay? So if we're going to start our friendship revolution, why would I even say that that would be so revolutionary? Well, it's because Jesus himself is saying that loving your neighbor is absolutely non-negotiable. We've got to do that. So, now, let me ask you, is there anything outside of the Bible, let's say you don't really respect the Bible, you're not sure about Jesus, but you respect science, okay? You got a hypothesis, you test it, and then you find out, is this really right or not? You could do this very thing with, with that statement of Jesus, love God, love your neighbor, see how that goes. Well, interestingly enough, um, on the internet, I started watching a bunch of videos when I was sick. I was sick this past week, right? Big surprise. Christmas Eve was rough. Thanks for putting up with me on that. But as I was watching, I found this video that now has become my favorite video. It's even better than Die Hard. And you know I like Die Hard, right? And some of you do. So anyway, so it, this is a really, I mean, this is probably my favorite video of all time right now that I wanted to share with you all. So I'm going to yield like eight or nine minutes of my preaching time to this video. That's how big a deal this is to me. Because there was a study done, and it's still going on. It's been going on for 75 years. It's the longest study on happiness human happiness that's ever been done, okay? And you're going to get to hear the director of it, who's not the one that started it 75 years ago, because he'd be like 120 now, right? But you're going to get to hear from him. And um, his name is Robert Waldinger. And, uh, and as you watch this, we're going to start about three minutes in. I'm going to send out the link later on, so if you want to watch the full 15 minutes of it, it's powerful, powerful. But I want you to be thinking about, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself is non-negotiable. It's important to God. It's, one of, it's, it's equal to this whole idea of loving God because you've got to love God and love people equally at the same time. You've got to, I mean, God's still first, but there's no way that you can love God without loving other people. This whole idea of loving other people, I want you to tie that together with what this guy says they've discovered in their study on what makes people truly happy on the long haul. Okay, let's watch. The Harvard study of adult development may be the longest study of adult life that's ever been done. For 75 years, we've tracked the lives of 724 men. Year after year, asking about their work, their home lives, their health, and of course, asking all along the way without knowing how their life stories were going to turn out. Studies like this are exceedingly rare. Almost all projects of this kind fall apart within a decade because too many people drop out of the study or funding for the research dries up or the researchers get distracted or they die and nobody moves the ball further down the field. But through a combination of luck and the persistence of several generations of researchers, this study has survived. About 60 of our original 724 men are still alive, still participating in the study, most of them in their 90s. And we are now beginning to study the more than 2,000 children of these men. 
and I'm the fourth director of the study. <laughs> Since 1938, we've tracked the lives of two groups of men. The first group started in the study when they were sophomores at Harvard College. They were from what Tom Brokaw has called the greatest generation. They all finished college during World War II, and then most went off to serve in the war. And the second group that we've followed was a group of boys from Boston's poorest neighborhoods. Boys who were chosen for the study specifically because they were from some of the most troubled and disadvantaged families in the Boston of the 1930s. Most lived in tenements, many without hot and cold running water. When they entered the study, all of these teenagers were interviewed, they were given medical exams. We went to their homes and we interviewed their parents. And then these teenagers grew up into adults who entered all walks of life. They became factory workers and lawyers and bricklayers and doctors, one president of the United States. Some developed alcoholism. A few developed schizophrenia. Some climbed the social ladder from the bottom all the way to the very top. And some made that journey in the opposite direction. The founders of this study would never in their wildest dreams have imagined that I would be standing here today, 75 years later, telling you that the study still continues. Every two years, our patient and dedicated research staff calls up our men and asks them if we can send them yet one more set of questions about their lives. Many of the inner city Boston men ask us, why do you keep wanting to study me? My life just isn't that interesting. The Harvard men never asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> to get the clearest picture of these lives, we don't just send them questionnaires. We interview them in their living rooms. We get their medical records from their doctors. We draw their blood. We scan their brains. We talk to their children. We videotape them talking with their wives about their deepest concerns. And when, about a decade ago, we finally asked the wives if they would join us as members of the study, many of the women said, you know, it's about time. <laughs> so what have we learned? What are the lessons that come from the tens of thousands of pages of information that we've generated on these lives? Well, the lessons aren't about wealth or fame or working harder and harder. The clearest message that we get from this 75-year study is this. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. We've learned three big lessons about relationships. The first is that social connections are really good for us and that loneliness kills it turns out that people who are more socially connected to family, to friends, to community are happier, they're physically healthier, and they live longer than people who are less well connected. And the experience of loneliness turns out to be toxic. People who are more isolated than they want to be from others find that they are less happy, their health declines earlier in midlife, their brain functioning declines sooner, and they live shorter lives than people who are not lonely. And the sad fact is that at any given time, more than one in five Americans will report that they're lonely. And we know that you can be lonely in a crowd, and you can be lonely in a marriage. So the second big lesson that we learned is that it's not just the number of friends you have, and it's not whether or not you're in a committed relationship but it's the quality of your close relationships that matters. It turns out that living in the midst of conflict is really bad for our health. High conflict marriages, for example, without much affection, uh, turn out to be very bad for our health, perhaps worse than getting divorced. And living in the midst of good, warm relationships is protective. 
once we had followed our men all the way into their 80s, we, we wanted to look back at them in, at midlife and to see if we could predict who was going to grow into a happy, healthy octogenarian and who wasn't. And when we gathered together everything we knew about them at age 50, it wasn't their middle-aged cholesterol levels that predicted how they were going to grow old. It was how satisfied they were in their relationships. The people who were the most satisfied in their relationships at age 50 were the healthiest at age 80. And good, close relationships seem to buffer us from some of the slings and arrows of getting old. Our most happily partnered men and women reported in their 80s that on the days when they had more physical pain, their moods stayed just as happy. But the people who were in unhappy relationships on the days when they reported more physical pain, it was magnified by more emotional pain. And the third big lesson that we learn about relationships and our health is that good relationships don't just protect our bodies, they protect our brains. It turns out that being in a securely attached relationship to another person in your 80s is protective. That the people who are in relationships where they really feel they can count on the other person in times of need, those people's memories stay sharper longer. And the people in relationships where they feel they really can't count on the other one, those are the people who experience earlier memory decline. And those good relationships, they don't have to be smooth all the time. Some of our octogenarian couples could bicker with each other day in and day out. But as long as they felt that they could really count on the other when the going got tough, those arguments didn't take a toll on their memories. So this message that good, close relationships are good for our health and well-being, this is wisdom that's as old as the hills. It's your grandmother's advice and your pastor's. Why is this so hard to get? For example, with respect to wealth, we know that once your basic material needs are met, wealth doesn't do it. If you go from making $75,000 a year to $75 million, we know that your health and your happiness will change very little, if at all. When it comes to fame, the constant media intrusion and the lack of privacy make most famous people significantly less healthy. It certainly doesn't keep them happier. And as for working harder and harder, there is that truism that nobody on their deathbed ever wished they had spent more time at the office. <laughs> Why is this so hard to get and so easy to ignore? Well, we're human. What we'd really like is a quick fix, something we can get that'll make our lives good and keep them that way. Relationships are messy and they're complicated and the, the hard work of tending to family and friends, that's not sexy or glamorous. It's also lifelong, it never ends. The people in our 75 year study who were the happiest in retirement were the people who had actively worked to replace workmates with new playmates. So let's just stop there for a second. And, uh, and like I said, I'll send this out if you want to see the whole thing. Um, but if you were to summarize, kind of, you know, he, he mentioned there are three points there. He went kind of, th kind of fast. Point number one, we all need social connections. We all need that. We deeply, deeply need that in order to be happy in life. We need people, relationships, friendships to be there. And then point number two, they need to be high quality. Like uh, we need not just... 2,000 friends on Facebook, or if you put a funny picture on there, you know, 2,000 people are going to be like, oh, this is great. I'm so glad you're my friend. But that's maybe surface level. You may not know them well. They may not be the person that you can call up if you're hurting or that they would call you if they're really excited about something in life. Like, you need those high quality. Like, to, to build high quality relationships then makes your entire life better. And it, there's nothing else equal to that. Like, having millions and millions of dollars given to you or becoming the most famous person in the world does not even come close to helping your life to be as happy as having those close, high-quality relationships. And then thirdly, 
he says good relationships then help our brains to stay healthier, like definitively. Did you pick up on his point that if you were a 50-year-old male and you went to your doctor and they were trying to figure out whether you're going to be healthy for the next 30 years, the number one question that they should ask you as a 50-year-old male is, do you have high-quality relationships with other people? So if you're married, is your spouse a, a, a good friend? Like, are, are you a good friend to them? Are they a good friend to you? Your other, other people, you know, can you name some people who are good friends of yours? And that if you have, yes, that's good, that's good, good relationship, that's a bigger indicator of your long-term health than any other factor. Cholesterol, you know, family history. Is, I mean, that's crazy, people. Like, this is like an insanely, like, mind-blowing fact. And he says, but why do we not, like, talk about it as much? Well, because, you know, when you're a 50-year-old male, it'd be easier if there's a pill to take that's going to help you to live longer, right? I mean, that's way easier than having a great friendship, right? I mean, that's way easier. And so the pharmaceutical company knows that too. And so, you know, they can make some money off of that. But it's way tougher to say, no, wait, I've got to make some new friendships or I've got to rekindle this relationship with a spouse or something like that. Whoa. So here we are in the church for a couple thousand years. We've known that our leader, Jesus, has said, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the best way to live. That's God's expectation. That's what to do. And now, kind of science is catching up to that, saying, oh, wait, we can definitively prove that that's even more important than your wealth, your fame, your job, you know, whatever. That's crazy important. So I'm excited to kind of kick off 2018, you know, starting tonight at, you know, whatever that, that when the clock ticks and, you know, the ball drops or whatever. I'm thinking, man, going into this next year, I want to really lean into that with my family, with my friends, but also for the church to say, wow, this, could, this would be revolutionary if we really embraced this, loved it, and lived it out. So love God, love people as you develop these deep friendships. Love God, love people as you develop these deep friendships. So you like to use the word friendship. We even use it in our our web address, right? Where friends are made. org. You know, you type that in, it comes up to Columbia Heights. Like, why would we do that? Because friendship with God and friendship with each other is essential. I mean, it, there is no question. And so here we go over the next several weeks talking about, okay, but how do you do that? And if you've got a, a broken relationship, how do you repair that? And if you don't have friends, like, how, do, how can we help that to happen? And, and how, do you, how do you do that, you know? And and Jesus has some amazing things to help. And other parts of the Bible have some amazing things to help us with that. But that's what we're leaning into. I'm super excited because our world needs this. And for a long time, when they look at Christian history, unfortunately, there are times where in history, you have to look really long and hard to find the Christian communities that live this out. Instead, they were saying, wait, we've got it right. That other Christian group doesn't. And that other non-Christian group doesn't. So we need to batten down the hatches and then fight them. Fight them burn them, right? I mean, that's crazy, but that's what happened. And we get this because remember, loving God still is first. God's the first one we're having that friendship with and that love for and that obedience to, which then when I'm trying to figure out who to be friends with, that means that God says they're all important. And I don't get to say, I'm only going to be friends with people with the same skin color as me, right? Jesus doesn't let me do that. He says, no, 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 love God, then love all your neighbors. And then he gives that example of the good Samaritan who wasn't Jewish, right? So racial differences, color differences. I don't get to say, I like the Bengals, and I will only be friends with people who root for the Cincinnati Bengals. If you're a Steelers fan, you know, I don't get to do that, right? I can't do that. I can't divide that line that hard. I mean, I can a little bit, but not, not in terms of I won't be your friend, right? You can't do that because you love God, and then God says, okay, I love everybody, so you got to love everybody. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's crazy amazing. As we live that out, like, you are going to have such a better life, and the people around you are going to be blessed, and some of you young folks, you're going to remember this day and say, you know what? That's when I decided yeah, it'd be cool to be famous, it'd be cool to be rich or whatever, but I know that that's not really going to make me happy. That's been proven definitively in a study. And before that, Jesus even said it, right? No, it's like, no, no, no. Those relationships are going to be number one. Then, if you make a ton of money or you get famous, whatever, cool. That's, I mean, that's great. But, but that's not the number one thing. And some of you people that are retired, you're going to say, wait a second, I'm going to reach out to those other people that are retired and are kind of off on their own, and it feels lonely. Because I know that we need each other. I need them. They need me. We're going to connect. I mean, does that sound like a cool church? I mean, isn't that awesome? 
Like we're a part of a church where we're called to do that. And it's not Nathan saying that. It's Jesus saying, here are the most important things. Love God, love your neighbor. Let's pray. God, we need help with this. Some Christians so-called in our country have struggled to do that, and they found ways to justify their hate, and we're not going to do that. And in Europe, there were some amazing things done by Jesus-loving people, and there were some horrible, hideous things done, even by pastors and priests that said they loved you, and they sure did not, because they didn't love their neighbor as themselves. And so God, do a miracle inside of us where we will receive your love and share your love in radical, world-changing ways because you're changing us from the inside out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.